Stephen, hi, and thank you so much for joining me for a discussion for Faces of Digital Health to discuss a little bit uh, where digital therapeutics are in Europe. We keep talking about uh, Germany, which has had a clear framework for uh, so-called DIGAS since 2019. We've learned a lot uh, from that example. Now France uh, is uh, around a year in the uh, framework called the PICAN, but actually you are from uh, Belgium, which has had ideas about regulating digital therapeutics since uh, 2018. And I look forward to discussing this and your experience in the space uh, in this discussion today. Yes, indeed. Uh, I'm one of the uh, coordinators of the MHL Belgium initiative, which is on a national level, uh, on Belgian level, the initiative that wants to help uh, creating awareness uh, about mobile medical uh, applications to, on the one hand, citizens, but also on the other hand, uh, healthcare professionals and all stakeholders in the domain. And since 2018, we have this uh, joint initiative. It started with a joint initiative, both by industry and government. Uh, but meanwhile, this changed, but we can go uh, later in, in detail uh, how it is now. But indeed, it's a, it's a portal uh, on www.mhlbelgium.be that wants to provide information uh, which medical apps fulfill certain criteria that are set by government. Mm -hmm. Let's go back in time a little bit. So this was already set up in 2018. Can you talk a little bit about how the conditions look like for this initiative to happen? So just to clarify, um, the uh, pyramid that kind of classifies digital therapeutic apps uh, has been uh, designed and kind of agreed upon between three organizations, the Federal Agency for Medicines and Health Products, and then the National Health uh, Institute or the National Institute for Health and Disability, which is an insurance, uh, basically, institute, and the industry. So this is already a huge success because many countries that are looking at, you know, DIGAS and PICAN, um, they just don't know where to start. You know, how are you going to uh, design a group that's going to, in the end, uh, facilitate the design of a framework and its enforcement? So how did this go down in Belgium? I can definitely explain, but maybe first uh, highlight, it didn't start in 2018. Basically, it already started in 2016. Uh, in 2018, it only, the, the pyramid starts, but in 2016, the uh, previous Minister of Health, Maki de Bloch, uh, on the federal level, already decided to investigate what mobile health could mean, what the added value could mean in the Belgian landscape uh, when we use such mobile medical applications. And what she did is she uh, launched a call for pilot projects and uh, 24 of these pilot projects got some subsidies and they run for uh, 6 to 12 months. All these pilot projects were in a combination of healthcare professionals, uh, tech providers uh, in different settings, hospital setting, home care setting. And out of these 24 pilot projects that were subsidized, they did an evaluation after one year and a half. And it's that at that evaluation that made clear there is uh, a need to have a validation framework and that the validation framework became then the, uh, the validation pyramid with the three layers, as you said, indeed. And that started off at end of 2018. And then the, the portal became, uh, went live uh, as, a, as a website in beginning of 2019. If we look now to the three uh, levels in the pyramid, uh, it's important to know that there is a hierarchical structure. So it all starts with level one. Level one is the broad basis. There, an app can start, and then it can rise into the pyramid from level one, the basis, towards level three, uh, towards level two first, and then, uh, uh, yeah, the the ultimate aim for many of these uh, tech providers, for many of these applications, is of course to be financed in the system, and that's where uh, level three uh, comes into the picture. So it's a broad basis, level one, towards a narrow top, level three, because the idea or the aim is not that all applications that enter level one also will reach level three. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not all applications that fulfill the basic criteria about CE certification, etc. I'll dive into that uh, in, in the next minutes that uh, need to have financing on the national level. But of course, many will uh, aim for that. 
Mm -hmm. So if I understand if I correctly, it, there's yeah. basically three levels. And um, one is to just be classified. And then the third one is to also be reimbursed by the national insurance. So indeed, level one is the broad basis, and there uh, the Federal Agency for Medicine and Health Products, who is uh, the agency responsible for uh, patient safety, doing inspections of, of, let's say, pharma and medical world, uh, there the, the basic criteria is to have a CE label. So you need to be a medical device. So it's only those apps, those tools uh, that, uh, that do medical claims, whatever whatever it is, diagnostic, therapeutic, monitoring, and that doesn't matter. Uh, the pathology domain also doesn't matter, but only if they do medical claims and are, have a CE label, then they can be classified in level one. That's where it all starts. Then level two, uh, originally level two was more uh, about some ICT uh, criteria you have to fulfill. Think about authentication, identification of the user, how you have to check uh, the relationship between patient and healthcare professional. There you need to fulfill, of course, certain standards to do so. And that it is uh, that the connection uh, is safely done, and then level three, it's in of course the top level. That uh, there the the decision is made by uh, the National Institute for Health and Disability Insurance, which is the the national payer authority, and they uh, judge and evaluate of course the dossier where you have to show your uh, social and economic uh, evidence uh, and the added value you bring into the care system. And. In the beginning, 24 applications were uh, assessed uh, in a year-long period. What happened to those applications uh, then, or what's happening with them uh, today? Are these applications that are still alive, or, or yeah, what what happened? Yes, some went to, into the pyramids, some uh, some not. Uh, this was a this was a, let's say all uh, a consortia of different stakeholders. But several of these uh, tech providers who were involved in this consortia have afterwards listed their application on the portal. But the portal is now open uh, since 2019 for all, so it doesn't. Uh, it's not anymore linked to those 24 who originally started in a, in a pilot case. Now it's open for every Belgian and international company. It doesn't matter. It's on the Belgian uh, uh, landscape uh, that you have to that you can become active. Uh, uh, and if you provide uh, the information uh, according to the criteria, uh, the Animal Belgium coordinator, like me, we just uh, act as a notary, we verify whether it is uh, valid or not, and then we we grant you the Animal Belgium quality seal if you fulfill the criteria. The judgment mm -hmm. about the reimbursement is, of course, was done by the National Payer Authority themselves. Okay. How many applications or solutions are currently in the Amheld Belgium portal? And what I'm wondering there is, like, how does that help vendors or healthcare providers if they see these applications on, on the portal? How well uh, is it utilized? Yeah, it's... Um... I think it's it's quite important as a kind of marketing and communication uh, tool uh, as well because uh, in the beginning it was not so well known uh, uh, widespread among uh, the different stakeholders the healthcare professionals but meanwhile this changed of course and what I hear is that many uh, hospitals or healthcare professionals that want to use it really verify whether the application uh, when a vendor comes to them and offers some uh, telemonitoring application or whatever that they check uh, is it on, listed on the ML Belgium portal so it, the quality seal becomes important the quality seal doesn't mean you will be financed uh, or there is reimbursement but it's at least uh, a, a validation that has been done according to criteria that are set originally by government mm -hmm. uh, currently there are between 35 and 40 applications who have that uh, quality seal, who are listed either in level one, level two. Um, once there was one also who got temporarily reimbursed and was in level three, but that's again uh, uh, changed uh, one year ago. So currently there is no one who is really being financed by the National Pay Authority, but still uh, it's an important tool uh, for communication, visualization. And uh, I hear from the companies who are there that in the market, it's, uh, it's still important to be listed there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely builds up the credibility of the company. So there's 35 applications uh, listed and none of them is actually financed or reimbursed by the insurance. At this moment, uh, none is uh, uh, really financed. No, that's true. Why? Unfortunately. <laughs> Why? That's a long and difficult story, but let's try to uh, uh, to explain it in, in, a, in a, as simple as possible way. 
uh, it started with the fact that in 2019, when the portal became live, uh, level three was still not live. So the, the template, uh, the procedure for reimbursement request uh, was not active. So that only is happening since beginning of 2021, which is also already three years ago. And then there were uh, several uh, dossiers submitted. Several companies submitted the dossier, did a reimbursement request, showed their added value into the market, uh, both clinically, but also organizationally uh, in different domains, uh, ranging from uh, uh, ambulatory care uh, for oncology patients, for sleep apnea, for heart failure patients, etc. Uh, but then uh, and they got evaluated by the uh, payer authority and most got positive evaluation, which is good. And that happened all in, in six months time. But then there is a second uh, part, a phase and that phase is is like a bit of black box model. What's happening there? They got positive evaluation. So they really show their uh, added value. Uh, the payer authority and healthcare professionals really believe they bring added value they, uh, into the system. But the finest thing has to be uh, changed. And that's difficult. And why? We are in Belgium, and I think in many countries, we still have a fee for service mechanism in, the, in uh, financing our healthcare. So that means uh, very basically that every act, every consult, everything is paid uh, uh, case by case. So there is also uh, an incentive to let, for instance, people come, uh, chronic patients, uh, uh, let them come on consultation uh, every six months, every year, depending from pathology to pathology. Uh, but there is no real incentive to do the follow-up via digital tools, via telemarketing, etc because then they will not be financed uh, for their act, for their uh, knowledge, for the follow-up they do. So the payer authority is aware of that and they want to change it. And therefore they want to go away from the, the way the financing is done nowadays, the fee for service mechanism, and they want to evolve into another system, which we can call a forfait system, bundle payment system. Uh, but that requires, of course, uh, a big change. And every change, as you know, and all will know, every change comes with resistance, resistance from people in the field. And then it's good to know that in our country, we have a quite complex consultation model. I don't will explain it in detail, but it comes down to the system that the, uh, the people working in the administration, they don't decide themselves. It's up to the, on the one hand, the uh, health insurers, the public health insurers, on the other hand, representatives of the healthcare professionals who have the voting power and they have to come to a consensus. And that's very difficult because there is always a bit of fear that uh, the change will harm them or will bring a less positive future also financially for them. So, so that's the reason why first those applications, they do a submitted dossier, they often get positive evaluations, but then the black box model starts because then the financing has to be changed for that pathology domain and they one will not finance the, the product itself one aims to finance the care pathway in which the technology can be used and that care pathway from a to z of course it has to be the boundaries have to be set that pathway will be then financed via a bundled payment via for fast system and that requires of course uh, um, yeah, big discussions yeah. and that's and there is no fixed timelines discussed there or agreed there. And that's why several of these applications in the different domains that I explained uh, from sleep uh, monitoring to uh, follow up uh, uh, cancer patients in an ambulatory setting, heart failure, etc. Mm -hmm. One is still figuring out uh, with the resistance, of course, uh, of the different stakeholders involved. And we expect in 2024, we expect a few of these care pods uh, uh, be listed and be financed differently. And then, of course, not only the submitter, but also other applications who are in that domain will be financed. So 2024 should be an important year, but it's already a long time ago since we started in 2021 with, the, uh, the, with having the financing potential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I totally get that. It makes sense if you have an app that is basically just a piece in the whole puzzle of the bundled payment, then somebody needs to decide how big that piece is and how that's going to be paid for. It's indeed just a piece because the technology is a mean. The technology is not the aim. So, And that's what the uh, the Belgian uh, authorities also uh, uh, think about. 
and they want to finance not the technology, they want to finance the use of the technology in the whole framework of a care pod and finance the care pod as such. How do then uh, these companies uh, finance themselves? How do they survive? Is it all out of pocket? How much are they looking also into other markets such as Germany or France? One thing that I thought was really interesting is that basically in Belgium you have to be um, in three languages. One of them is French. So I'm wondering, you know, how many companies are looking at the French uh, model now? But I now I ask three questions. So let's yeah, start with indeed. the first I will one. Start how with how the do first they one. survive? <laughs> that's, that's a good and a tricky question because, of course, uh, some of these companies are uh, multinational, established companies, and, and then it's an, uh, an add-on on, on their classical, let's say, uh, equipment and systems or implants or whatever business. Uh, but several of these companies are also very focused and uh, in the niche domain of digital technology. That's their only uh, product, that's their only way of surviving, that's their only uh, thing they can bring to the market. So that's also where the revenues have to come from. And then it's difficult because if you don't have, if there's no financing and nobody is using it because of that reason. Uh, so we see that there is less appetite. So uh, indeed, uh, uh, they have to go to other markets, even the Belgian uh, companies uh, who have uh, good products, they have to go elsewhere. Uh, one of the good cases here is Fribicek. Fribicek is an application for uh, uh, heart uh, uh, atrial fibrillation patients, uh, but uh, not via holter recording, but just via uh, you're putting your finger on the, on the camera of your smartphone. And they do uh, via intelligent AI algorithms detect uh, atrial fibrillation and other things. But they can't live, they can't generate revenues just from being uh, with that medical product on the Belgian market. So they have to look first, already years ago, they looked to different uh, uh, in generating incomes, uh, generating revenues, different ways. But they have partnerships with Fitbit and with consumable, uh, consumable markets. They have uh, with uh, uh, private health insurers. They also went not uh, anymore to the Belgian market, but they look uh, abroad. They are in the NHS system and the UK. They have success in, in the Netherlands because in the Netherlands there is a different healthcare mechanism and it's more already in a bundled payment system. And then, of course, if you as a healthcare professional can use such technology and you still have the same amount of money you will get, then you use the technology instead of just letting the patient come to your office uh, for an extra consultation. So they have to look abroad. Uh, they have to look to other uh, uh, ways of uh, generating revenues, partnerships, etc. Uh, and mm -hmm. that's how they do. And we see also that the uh, appetite in the market um, and uh, yeah, became much less in Belgium the last years because of the fact that we don't have this clear vision. Uh, or There is a vision, but we don't have uh, success stories. And that's really uh, a pity because then they have to look abroad. Uh, and so they go to uh, surrounding countries. Uh, like uh, the and, DJ yeah, in Germany, and the, like they, they're basically France. disappointed again. My my impression they're is disappointed like disappointed, and at, so yeah. even for Belgian companies, uh, we we can say there is no home market success, uh, even mm -hmm. when it's in the pipeline. But if you don't know when it will happen, uh, in six months, in in one year, in one year and a half, two years, it's difficult uh, to survive as a company. Yeah, yeah. Based on the. Um, of, things I'm seeing in the US or in Germany, um, still gonna, we're going to see what's kind of going to happen in France. But in these two markets, so US and Germany, I see that there's kind of like a lot of disappointment and people are kind of giving up because there's no clear reimbursement mechanism or because, um, yeah, these technologies, while they are very useful, are not a solution like pills are so it seems that w the industry uh, as such is giving up a little bit on ddx not quite yet but yeah, i'm really wondering true. what's going to happen the, the, after the lack friends. of perspective is very difficult if, if there is an, if there is a lack of perspective it's difficult uh, to go on uh, uh, and because I, in my in my opinion, uh, I see that uh, adoption uh, and adoption on a, on a bigger scale comes uh, in the healthcare domain with two uh, things. On the one hand, of course, there need to be trust uh, uh, into the into the product and into the system. And the second thing is uh, often financing, especially in healthcare, because 
we are quite familiar that everything is i wouldn't say for free but it's cheap and eh? it's not paid mm -hmm. out of pocket it's different as in the us market of course eh? where it's more yeah. a liberal market we are more in a social market uh, yeah. regarding healthcare it's... at least but i think i'm just gonna comment here uh i've been thinking about this uh, uh and i think i guess what we need is some bravery in terms of somebody on the political level being yeah just bold enough to actually try and give these technologies a try to see what the broader impact could be because for example if we look at the diga apps there's around 60 at the moment uh, in the um, yeah. database and a lot of them are related to mental health to depression to um, anxieties etc and i think broadly globally we've got a huge shortage of healthcare professionals so while these applications are not like a replacement for therapy and the discussions that you have with an actual therapist i think we are missing out on the potential that we could um, um, leverage on just uh, giving more people at least some support instead of nothing where waiting times for you know a clinical psychology evaluation can be a year or longer um so i'm yeah i'm kind of puzzled why nobody is really digging a bit more boldly it's 100 percent true that. and I, I i agree uh and i think uh, we should even more stress uh, the value it can bring because the value is not only for patients the value is also there for healthcare professionals to tackle shortages and other challenges we will face in our healthcare system. Uh, uh, shortage of staff is one. Um, we also see that patients are become more empowered, not patients, citizens uh, overall. So this also helps uh, in taking their health in their own hands uh, often. Uh, and uh, it's also delivering often better quality of care. Think especially about chronic patients. Uh, there is uh, more accurate follow-up uh, if you use uh, often these technologies. Mental health, indeed true. Uh, there I have to say, and then that's very, very specific for the Belgian context, uh, mental health is uh, a bit out of scope in, for the Belgian context because uh, it's not anymore on the level of the, uh, on the national level that it is uh, uh, discussed and financed. It's on the regions, so that's more uh, another mm -hmm. political complexity. Uh, where is the responsibility uh, for prevention and for mental health? In Belgium, this is not on, uh, not anymore on the federal level, but on the regional level. Uh, and the system we have with ML Belgium, with the validation pyramid, is an is a federal system. Uh, but that's a bit okay uh, out of discussion. Uh, yeah, but yeah. I see. But I see indeed that in in in, uh, in the Diga in Germany, most uh, applications or a lot of these applications are on DTX and mental health focusing. And there, I have to also to stress: in Belgium, we don't focus uh, really on DTX. Uh, digital therapeutics we focus more on uh, it's called m health belgium they focused on mobile health nowadays it's difficult to explain what mobile health is because mobile everything is becomes mobile yeah. but one aims basically those applications that are used by patients uh, and um, allow them to interact uh, and share data with healthcare professional and secondly also telemonitoring applications so here's a, is here is the difference with uh, uh, what we see in Belgium as under ML Belgium, a lot of telemonitoring applications. For instance, in DIGA, it's more focused on digital therapeutics, where uh, also the healthcare profession is not obliged to uh, to interact. In the Belgian setting, the interaction with the healthcare profession is crucial and essential and obliged when you aim for reimbursement. And that's similar in PECO in France. There also the interaction with between patient and healthcare professional is really required. Mm -hmm. What are the differences that you see between the three frameworks? So the uh, French, the German, and the Belgian. How do uh, like maybe we can if we try to limit ourselves? How does this look like from the vendor perspective? How much do these frameworks help? How much are they they are just debilitating for the vendor when trying to enter the market? From a vendor point of view, uh, there are similarities, uh, like uh, you need to see e-certification. Uh, I think uh, the the proof of evidence regarding uh, security, regarding authentication, ICT standards, uh, uh, interoperability is probably similar. Huh? I don't know exactly whether the difference is, but it's probably similar. Uh, the uh, the evidence you have to bring uh, is 
probably can be the same, but uh, it will be judged every case again. So there is no harmonization on a European level so far that once, uh, let's say, the evidence is judged in one country, that country two, three or four also uh, will agree on that. So that is, of course, from a vendor perspective, a difficult one because maybe you can use or bring the same evidence uh, in your dossier, but the judgment and the procedures are in every country slightly different and has to be done uh, again and again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did you by any chance talk to any companies that are also trying to enter the French market? I'm yeah wondering if anybody has already any experiences with that process. I think there are a few who are also uh, uh, from from Amal Belgium uh, started, and they look now to Diga uh, to uh, to Pico. Uh There are several ones, uh, and also vice versa. Uh, for instance, we we have uh, uh, in in France there is Resilience, who is a, a company uh, doing. Uh, a, yeah, activities for uh, cancer patients, the follow-up of cancer patients, they got financed in uh, in uh, in France, uh, not under PECON, but in another system, because in France you have more than the PECON system. Uh, and now uh, they they are the first dossier that submitted in the new MHealth procedure uh, a, a reimbursement request. So they will be evaluated and judged in Belgium too. So it's also, and I know also from, from Germany there are a few who are preparing the dossier uh, to submission uh, on the Belgian level. So it's in different directions that this, uh, that this is going. Mm -hmm. You're following this field very closely. So we, managed, uh, we mentioned a lot of challenges that the space is facing. And based on the fact that many approaches have been tried out, in order to get these technologies used in practice in healthcare. What are some of your expectations or, I don't want to say predictions, but, you know, based on your knowledge, where do you see that the field is going? I think on a European level? Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, feel free to say whatever you want about, you yeah, know, either country European level, level or European uh, level. But it's, let's start from a European level. Uh, there is, an, uh, there is a task force uh, working on harmonization, harmonization in terminology, but also harmonization in how HDA, eh, health technology assessments, has to look like specifically for digital health uh, products. I hope, eh, <laughs> I don't know whether it will be true, but I hope uh, this will uh, uh, leverage uh, it to bring technologies to different markets uh, in a similar way, faster and sooner, because in the end, that's what we aim for, uh, not only tech providers, but also uh, as a society, bringing the technologies when they are creating value, when they are validated, that has to is very important, of course, bring them faster and uh, bring the innovations faster to the market that they can be used easier and sooner by healthcare professionals of patients. That's only in the advantage of the healthcare system overall. And on a Belgian level, I would say, uh, but I already, uh, I'm still positive, uh, uh, though we have all these challenges uh, over the, the last years, but I hope that 2024 will be a bit uh, uh, a year of change and that even those dossiers who already were, are in the pipeline for a couple of years will land in 2024. Uh, I think about sleep uh, monitoring, I think about uh, uh, telemonitoring for heart failure patients, also for cancer patients to follow up remotely. These dossiers should land, and then we can have some success stories. We can have some uh, uh, cases that are really used because nowadays these technologies are also used and, and uh, in Belgium, but it's on an ad hoc basis. Hospital X, Y, and Z they want to be innova uh, innovate, uh, innovative minded, and they they really use it. Of, of course, they have to finance it themselves. They have to uh, arrange it because there is no national financing, but they do it. And these stories also help to put pressure on the governments, on the politics, to really embrace it, to really uh, uh, enlarge the system and make it easier to apply for, and mm -hmm. that things go faster. Mm -hmm. we because we have, we have uh, in the practical uh, reality, we have success stories, but it's not widely used because it's not scalable at, at the moment, is if, the, mm -hmm. is if there is no financing. Yeah, absolutely. So we the started... added value has been shown. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Which again brings us to the complexity of how, you know, like the usability, I guess, is one thing, but we're still struggling with the how to best fit that into the system. Uh, mostly, yeah, I guess, that's, from the regulation that's how and finance struggle, point uh, of view. Yeah, yeah. And there, of course, the um, difficulties of uh, the financing, uh, and that's a bit the difference between Belgium and, let's say, the two other countries who are also uh, uh, embracing the in innovation. In Germany, with Liga, in, Fran in France, with Picard, they have budgets uh, for this, sometimes large budgets, uh, and they also finance the products themselves. Mm -hmm. In Belgium, as I already explained earlier, we don't have separate budgets, uh, so every budget is in silos and uh, the digital health uh, brings value in a transversal way over the different silos. Uh, because if you uh, prevent uh, rehospitalization, okay, you save in hospitalization cost, but you create, a, 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 of course, a cost elsewhere, which is maybe smaller. And so in, in the end, you do savings. But mm -hmm. if everybody is safeguarding their own silos, their own budgets, it's become difficult to implement it. Uh, yeah. So we have to overcome that way of thinking. Yeah. You know what? That's exactly what I was thinking when uh, I was talking about mental health apps before. Uh, if you go to the DIGA directory now, they also have price tags um, uh, there. And some of them are, I don't know, between 300 or 700 euros. So for an app, that really sounds a lot. But if you think that maybe the help of that app would prevent somebody uh, from being on sick leave uh, for months. That's a huge, you know, benefit uh, and yeah, economic value instead of paying, I don't know, a few thousand euros for somebody's uh, leave of absence because of an illness and you put a few hundred euros in just so that person can still function and be productive. There's a it's true it's true because uh, we all speak about value based healthcare the way to go but in reality uh, we often don't go to into that direction and I think digital technologies are a, a really an enabler eh? they are not a goal but an enabler to do so uh, but yeah it still is uh, difficult to implement it if everybody mm -hmm. uh, keeps on saving their own silos uh, and protecting their own incomes etc. Mm. The M, uh, so the platform for applications in Belgium uh, was managed, if I'm not mistaken, by the three collaborators that went into the project. So the insurance, the e-health platform and the uh, Federal Agency for Medicines and Health Products. And that ended in 2023, where if, and correct me if I'm wrong, the MedTech, uh, BMedTech basically took over the platform. So can you just explain that? Uh, the collaboration between the three organizations ended in 2023. So that kind of makes me wonder what's going to happen next. Did the national organizations give up? What does that mean for for the actual future? So indeed, it was a, a joint initiative uh, originally. And joint initiative, I mean the three healthcare authorities decided the, uh, uh, the criteria and the two uh, uh, industry federations, BMETEC and Agoria, I belong to BMETEC, uh, we did the operational management. We built the platform, we did the, uh, the, the daily operations, etc. We also got some money to do that uh, from the government and that ended in 2023. Uh, why? Because uh, we did a lot of, a lot of advocacy uh, to improve it over the last years. Uh, and there was also a report made by an independent uh, organization that said, how should it be better? And the uh, payer authority, uh, so the National Institute for Health and Disability Insurance, the payer authority used that report beginning of 2023 to come with a new procedure, a new template, etc. So there has been done changes in a good way. Uh, uh, and so the new procedure is active uh, and with new templates, etc. It's not only industry that can apply, also a group of healthcare professionals, hospitals, uh, health insurers, they all can apply. And that's only good that it's not only driven by the industry themselves. Uh, and that new procedure came into uh, action. Uh, we, we did a lot of advocacy uh, towards that. Uh, came to action since October 2023. And in that new procedure, uh, 
the submission for reimbursement request can be done directly to the uh, to the authority, the payer authority. So there is no officially there is no need anymore to pass via the ML Belgium portal. But of course, the different uh, actors still want to be listed there. And we, as BMATIC and Agoria, as uh, um, industry sector federations, we decided to go on, to go on, of course, but adapted to the new reality. Mm -hmm. So we believe it still uh, brings value to list there the different uh, apps, be it only level one or also those who will be uh, uh, financed, uh, because it will be a given overview, both for citizens, both for healthcare professionals, uh, in which domains are there apps who are financed or who are not financed. And that overview is very important. Of course, we have to uh, be honest, and we also believe it's useful to do a, a further advocacy, to put pressure on the system, but it's also bringing the information in a structured way is still valuable, we believe. So that's why Absolutely. we, Bimetek and Arroya, continue in the new setting, of course, in an adapted way. And we also want to bring uh, uh, more uh, transparent information. For instance, also those uh, in the past, those applications who requested uh, uh, for level three for reimbursement, uh, it was not listed, who was it, etc. Now we really list those applications, did they request, they did this, uh, 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 the submission that date, that was uh, uh, the evaluation uh, outcome. And, and we all want to bring that in, in a transparent way. Mm. Um, yeah, it's definitely useful to have an overview also for, you know, decision makers in other countries that are trying to make sense and figure out how they might want to go about this field in their respective uh, country. Stephen, thank you so much for uh, sharing all the insights and we are going to definitely uh, circle back to Belgium, say in a year, to see what additional progress has been made. My pleasure to do so and uh, definitely worth uh, to do a follow-up later.